Right. M many thanks uh, to the organizers of this, um, of this meeting. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, and uh, it's a privilege to, I consider it like my duty to um, address the issues pertinent to the ongoing war in Ukraine. Uh, I'll do it. Yeah. yeah, okay, good. Uh, to address the uh, ongoing war in Ukraine. And I think this is a very, very good, very proper audience to discuss this uh, from the perspective of public theology. That's what I'm going to do. Let me start with the, with the beginning. First things first. Uh, Christianity emerged on the margins of the Roman imperial public space. It was born marginalized in both Roman and Jewish settings. This experience of initial marginalization became somehow encoded in the very DNA of the Christian ecclesial body, as it were. Even the following centuries, when the church would come to occupy the central part of the public space, did not only modern Anabaptism, Puritanism, etc. So it's really interconfessional. Uh, th this DNA appears in different confessional settings. When the Roman political establishment began embracing Christianity, <coughs> which meant that the church would substitute the polytheistic cults uh, as a new imperial public religion, Christians faced a difficult dilemma. For many, this would mean to betray the original non-confessional ethos of the Jesus movement. For others, especially those uh, brought up in the Roman political culture, it seemed normal that their religion would be politically and socially privileged. A compromise was reached between the two attitudes. The church eventually embraced the Roman Empire, however, not as an empire, but as, a, as the promised millennial kingdom. Byzantine political theologians, starting with Eusebius of Caesarea, presented the Roman Empire as a reflection of God's kingdom. They believed and tried, tried to make others to believe that the pagan empire miraculously changed almost overnight to something different, a millennial kingdom. This was, of course, a naive and deceitful belief. The miracle did not happen, and the Cinderella did not turn overnight into a princess. Nevertheless, a process of evolution, which was triggered by the reconciliation, recognition of the church by the Roman Empire, uh, began transforming both the empire and the church. In their assimilation, it is difficult to say who changed more. The fact is that both have changed. A painfully Procrustean process of assimilation was described by the euphemism of symphonia, a kind of a key word of my presentation, or harmony between the church and the state. Such a symphonia was never symphonic, however. It crushed the church's limbs and attempted at uh, reco uh, recoding its DNA. It also affected the ecclesial self-awareness. Most Christians adopted an idea that the church and the state are the same. The idea of separation or disestablishmentness, I love this English word, I think it is the longest one, disestablishmentness, would be unthinkable for them. This idea was summarized in the late 14th century by the patriarch Anthony IV of Constantinople in his letter to the Grand Duke Basil I of Moscow. I quote, it is not possible for Christians to have a church and not to have an emperor. That's what he said. Very soon, Antony's successors to the patriarchal throne would have to realize that this is quite possible. I mean, not to have an emperor and being a Christian. Constantinople, the capital of the Eastern Christian Empire, fell in 1453, and the imperial church was dis, uh, disestablished. Christianity, like in the early centuries, again found itself on the margins of the public space, which was now occupied by Islam. It was like concluding a cycle. Christianity had emerged in the beginning as a non-public religion and was contested by the public religion of paganism. After Constantine, the church replaced paganism as a new public religion. With the emergence of Islam, it replaced Christianity in most public spaces across the East. And the church eventually returned to what it had been in the beginning, a non-public marginalized religion. A new situation of disestablishmentness was not always acknowledged in the church, especially by its top hierarchs. 
they suffered from phantom pains caused by the separation from the state. And they invented simulacra of symphonia, which somehow soothed their pain. For some, the Ottoman authorities became new symphonic partners. For example, Patriarch of Jerusalem Anthemus praised in the late 18th century the Ottomans as more successful as rulers and more beneficial to the church than even the Byzantine Basilevses had been. The Ottomans did not mind to be acknowledged by their Christian subjects as new Basilevses. Sultans even adopted for themselves the title which is less known than the title of Sultan, Kaiser Irum, which literally means from Turkish, the Caesar of the Romans. So, Sultans were perce perceived themselves as Caesars, just to make, to please their Orthodox subjects. The relationship that the Christian church developed with Kaiser Irum could be called Ottoman to be an important part of this experience. And I developed this uh, prelude exactly to explain what is going on here, because we cannot understand, you know, the, uh, the events even now as they evolving now without going back to, to those centuries, to the uh, Ottoman Symphony and even further to the, to the Byzantine Symphony. So when modernity struck the Ottoman Empire, <clears throat> it inspired local Orthodox populations to seek political independence. Several states uh, seceded from the sick man of Europe, as they call Turkey, and their peoples embraced strong ethnic identities. These identities helped them in nation building. They also reshaped their church life. For these people, independence of their churches, the so-called autocephaly, became as important as their own language, literature, and schools. It, autocephaly has become really an, an identity. That is how a number of new churches declare themselves independent from the ecumenical patriarchate. Ethnos substituted the empire as a new symphonic partner for these churches. Just as the coming of the Ottomans to replace the Byzantine Basilevsis did not abolish symphonia but modified it, so the peoples who em emancipated from the Ottoman Empire reinvented symphonia. Well, there was something good about this invention, I believe. It was driven by a powerful momentum of emancipation from the centuries-long imperial mentality. The emancipated churches and peoples tried to stop thinking and perceiving themselves in the imperial terms. The Orthodox churches thus evolved to be less imperial and hierarchical. They preferred to be more egalitarian and affiliated more with people than authorities. This idea was captured in the famous concept of subordinate conciliarity. Well, I believe this concept, is, uh, this concept is a bit romantic. It describes more what the Orthodox want to believe about their churches than what it is in reality. The reality, in the meantime, gradually diverged from the original intention of nation-based emancipation. Identifying themselves with ethnic identity made the churches embrace national or even nationalistic agendas. Christian theology amplified and sacralized these agendas. Nationhood became sacred for many Orthodox nations, even though originally uh, it was a product of secular and, uh, enlightenment thinking. So that is the paradox. The idea of nationhood is, complete, is, is secular and was embraced by the Orthodox as something sacred, and they use it to counterpose themselves, themselves to, uh, to the enlightenment. That is how modern religious nationalism has emerged and continues to shape modern Eastern Christianity. This nationalism is symphonic in its nature. Again, symphony is, seems to be perennial. It is built on the assumption of coherence between ethnic and ecclesial interests. In effect, however, it leads to, blur, uh, to blurring demarcation lines between Christian theology and nationalistic ideology. This ideology has proven to be as harmful as its imperial counterpart. During the 20th century, both imperial and nationalistic ideologies have inspired quite a few dictatorships. Of course, we know the dictatorships uh, in Europe, like in Germany, in Nazi Germany, uh, fascist Italy, but there are some less known 
uh, dictatorships that uh, existed in the, ortho in the Orthodox Eastern Christian contexts. For example, in the Middle East and Africa, there is a long and revered tradition according to which the churches support local autocrats, including the modern ones, such as Isaiah Safwerki in Eritrea or Bashar al-Assad in Syria. Europe also has a long re record of dictatorships, which flourished especially in the interwar period. Some happen even in our days. The most democratic of all Orthodox countries, Greece, had in its 20th century anamnesis the semi-fascist regime of Ioannis Metaxas from 1936 through 1941, and later the junta or junta of the black colonels from 1967 through 1974. In Romania, the fascist national legionary state, which lasted just about two years, 40, 41, succeeded the dictatorship of King Carol II and preceded the, preceded the dictatorship of General Ion Antonescu. A Bulgarian dictatorship started with the coup in 1934 and was succeeded in 1935 by the royal dictatorship introduced by King Boris III. In Serbia, the 20th, 20th century began with the so-called 6th of century or 6th of January dictatorship, which lasted 1929 through 1931, established by King Alexander I, and concluded with the dictatorship of Slobodan Milosevic. Some Serbs argue that the current political regime of Aleksan Alexander Vucic is not much different from a dictatorship. Russia is of course, a champion of dictatorship. In the terms of both brutality and long longevity, since the beginning of modern times, Russia has enjoyed only a few years of republicanism. For from February through October 1917, just really seven months, and under the presidency of Boris Yeltsin during the 1990s. The rest of the time, there was either hereditary or non-hereditary monarchy in this country. And Putin is certainly an example of a non-hereditary monarch. Most of these uh, dictators made explicit references to Byzantium and claimed direct descendants from it uh, for their political regimes. In 1934, uh, 1934 the famous Romanian Byzantino uh, Byzantinologist Nikolai Yorga published a breakthrough book, Byzance après Byzance. Uh, it, it was a scholarly study about how the legacy of the Byzantine Empire survived this empire and was transmitted to different milieu during the centuries that followed its collapse. This study was also an implicit political manifesto for Yorga's contemporaries. It effectively stated that Byzantium can be reincarnated in non-imperial modern forms of statehood. Yorga was called to implement his dreams about Byzantium after Byzantium in the political life of the interwar Romania when King Carol II uh, appointed him in 1931 as the country's prime minister. Carol was building a royal dictatorship and Yorga became a useful instrument to legitimize his regime. Since then, Byzantium has been a convenient instrument of, legitim of legitimizing dictatorships in the traditional Orthodox countries. Each modern Orthodox dictatorship developed its own form of Byzantinism, an ideology that can be summarized, summarized, as, can be summarized as make Byzantium great again. Thus, the Greeks became fascinated by the so-called great idea, Megali idea, which is nothing else but a modern Greek form of Byzantinism. This is an idea that the modern Greek state should, imit uh, should imitate Byzantium, both in size and ideology. Although this idea uh, led to the expulsion of Hellenism from Asia Minor in the early 1920s, which the, Greek, the Greeks called the Micrasian catas catastrophe, it remained popular with the Greek dictators. A Greek dictator of the interwar period, whom I mentioned, Ioannis Metaxas, for example, described his regime as the third Hellenic Republic, a civilization, civilization, a modern version of the ancient Spartan and medieval Byzantine civilizations. It's interesting that Metaxas referred not to the Athenian democracy, but to the Spartan autocracy. In the interwar Romania, the name of the fascist legion of Arch Archangel Michael 
uh, referred to the conquest of D Dacia but ro by Roman legions. This was uh, an indirect allusion to Byzantium, the Eastern Roman Empire. Vladimir Putin's regime also finds its ra uh, rationalization in Byzantium. One of the regime's main ideologies, Alexander Dugin, has made Byzantinism a core of his views. Byzantinism for him, and he precisely uses this word, Byzantinism, as an ideology, as an ideological construct, and I quote him, presupposes an intrinsic connectedness of political and religious missions. Byzantium, as, as well as all its successors, including Russia, is a bearer of the religious, soteriological, and eschatological mission. Dugin, Dugin argues that the Russian society at its core is Byzantine-like, it is patriarchal and traditional. It sees in the supreme ruler, so he uses the word supreme ruler, ruler a paternal, almost mystical figure. End of quote. In the Tsarist period, the sacralization of power in Russia was based, and again I quote him, was based on the theory of katechon, the biblical term, uh, the holder, borrow, borrowed also from the Byzantine Empire and transmitted to Russia as Moscow the Third Rome at the end of the 15th century. So for Dugin, the roots of the Russian civilizational exceptionalism, exceptionalism that's how I identify the uh, current Putin's ideology, civilizational exceptionalism. So for him, uh, this uh, civilizational exceptionalism uh, goes back to Byzantium. Even the communist regime could, be, could not eradicate uh, uh, these kind of insights altogether inste and instead it adjusted them to fit Marxism. Dugin, for example, is talking about the Red Monarchs, the general secretaries of the Communist Party, the Red Monarchs, an almost religious cult of Lenin and the glorification of Stalin's personality. With the advent of Putin, Dugin continues, and by virtue of his truly decisive patriotic reforms, the autocratic principle unfolded in full force. The Russian people want only Putin and no one else. And for this, they are ready to change the constitution and everything else. Putin is the supreme ruler, I continue quoting Dugin, the savior of Russia. By making reference to, by references to Byzantium, Dugin explains even the Russian war against Ukraine. Uh, this war, which he calls operation, it's like illegal to call this war uh, a, a war. They call it the special operation. And he, he says, it's justified precisely at the level of the people. So it's not the Putin's war, it's the people's war, the people's of Russia, Russia's war. Byzantinism, for the orthodox uh, ideologies from Yorga to Dugin, necessarily presupposes intrinsically symphonic relations between the church and the state. That's how we go back to this uh, symphony, idea of symphony between the church and the state, because it's at the core of any sort of Byzantinism uh, that uh, has existed so far. They see Byzantium as the panacea for modern secularization and separation between the religious and political realms. Religion, from this perspective, needs to be reestablished politically. Indeed, in all the mentioned cases of Orthodox dictatorships, one may notice that the churches receive privileges and a special place in the public square and at its very center. Their ad uh, admission to this uh, square, however, is not free. The churches are expected to support dictators and boost their legitimacy in people's eyes. The Orthodox churches were usually eager to play this role. One of Yorga's successors, successors as the Prime Minister of Romania was the Patriarch of, of the Romanian Orthodox Church, Miron Cristea. He was a Prime Minister also in the interwar period, a successor of Yorga. He served in such political capacity under the royal dictatorship of King Karl II. Patriarch Kirill of Moscow, although he does not hold any formal position in Putin's government, is the main supplier of ideology for the Kremlin in the same vein of, uh, of Symphonia. He also plays a key role in legitimizing Putin's regime and its war against Ukraine. For example, in his sermon on September the 1st, 2022, just a month ago, the, uh, the Patriarch explained the war as a battle with the cosmic evil. 
For him, this evil is being advocated by the West, who has allied itself with the devil himself. And I just want to remind the last uh, address, public address by Putin on the 30th of September when he said that the West is satanic. Well, a big shaitan in the, in the language of, uh, of radical politicized uh, uh, Muslims. I will skip uh, quoting uh, Patrick Kirill to save time. By evil, the patriarch means the corruption of what he calls traditional values. However, if one applies his words to what Russia and its propaganda are doing in Ukraine and the, ba and the rest of the world with, with an important input by the patriarch himself, one will have a concise explanation of the war and its ideological underpinnings. Ironically, the patriarch is the most eloquent accuser of himself and Putin's regime, even though he does not seem to realize this. So the rhetoric that he applies to the West is completely applicable to Russia. You know, the violators, the, the, uh, the abusers and so forth. The only thing, if you substitute, you know, the West with Russia, you will have the picture as we see it. They don't see this picture. And I believe this is because uh, his thinking is encaged within this Byzantine symphonic paradigm. In this paradigm, relations between the church and the state are prioritized even over the gospel's truth. They can even become more important than what Jesus Christ commissioned to the church. Whatever the patriarch thinks about it, the war has become an epic failure of the ideology of Byzantinism and of any attempt to resurrect the Byzantine sort of symphonia between the church and the state in our days. Well, what could be an alternative to this sort of symphonia? I suggest that it is more beneficial for the church to develop part partnership with civil society than the, with the state or nationhood. This partnership can be also called symphonia. Mutual respect, disposition for dialogue, and ability to learn from each other are among the conditions sine qua non for such symphonic relationship. Civil society could and probably should be secular, but its partnership with the church must not repeat the old patterns of either secularism or clericalism. And I use exactly these words with ism in the end, like as indicators of ideology. Just as like Dugin used ism in order to identify the Byzantine ideology. According to both patterns, I mean secularism and clericalism, one of the partners wanted to prevail over the other one. The secular society wanted to marginalize religion. Uh, while the church wanted to bring back an ancien regime uh, when it controlled the public square. The symphony I'm talking about should avoid both forms of mutual exclusion. Such a symphony is not just a wishful theory. It can, and actually, I believe, did become a reality in the uh, Eastern Christian context. The Ukra Ukrainian Revolution of Dignity, which took place during the winter 2013 and 14 has demonstrated that a mutually beneficial partnership between the church and civil society is possible in the Eastern Christian context. This revolution contested the corrupt and authoritarian regime of the then president of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych. It was triggered by Yanukovych's sudden refusal to sign the political association and free trade agreement with the European Union. At that time, the revolution was seen as an affirmation of the European track for Ukraine. In fact, however, it turned out to be much more than that. It demonstrated the power of civil society against a totalitarian regime. And I mean not only the regime of Yanukovych, but also of Putin, who experienced, experiences really panic attacks when he sees any manifestation of free civil society. He doesn't believe that civil society can exist. He believes that it is always manipulated by someone, by someone behind the scenes. Well, meaning, of course, the United States. For him, such a society is an existential threat, which he tries to eliminate. For this reason, he waged the war against Ukraine in February 2014, a few days after the victory of the Revolution of Dignity. This war continues to our days. In a sense, the Ukrainian Revolution of Dignity con continues as well, Nowadays, however, its scale is the entire country which is protecting itself from the Russian aggression. So and I interpret this war as 
an extension, a continuation of the revolution of dignity that took place in 2013-14. <clears throat> in December 2013, the revolution concentrated in the central square of Kyiv, the Maidan of Independence, for which reason it is usually re referred to simply as the Maidan. This feature makes it relevant to the topic of our conversation here, public theologies in vibrating cities. Maidan, the main public place of the city of Kyiv, also became a birthplace of the distant Ukrainian public theology. And Kyiv at that time, and still now, is quite vibrating physically from bombardments. On December 13, 2013, a few days after the Maidan began, and when it was still unclear how it would end, I published on Facebook, actually, a post. It was shared widely on social media and was republished uh, in various translations with a title attached to it, which I didn't invent, The Theology of the Maidan. So later I unpacked this post to a book a titled Ukrainian Public Theology, mentioned by Rudolf. So let me bring some points from, uh, from this post, and I apologize for quoting myself. I think it is quite, it's still quite relevant uh, to what is happening now. So I quote myself, sorry. The Maidan has changed the country, the society, as well as the relations between the Ukrainian churches and the Ukrainian society. Historically, the church in both the Christian East and the Christian West had mostly two-dimensional relations with what we now call public political sphere, which is also known under the Greek word politia. Indeed, these relations existed almost exclusively between the church and the state. Only relat relatively recently did the churches begin to realize that these two dimensions could be insufficient. There exists a third important dimension, the society, which in our time has become self-sufficient in relationship with the state. This realization is focusing, uh, uh, is forcing the churches to depart from the two-dimensional relations church-state and arrive at the three-dimensional relationship church state, society, or to put it in a better order, church, society, state, where the state takes the third, the, la the last place. Uh, the Maidan pushed the churches to rise above the status quo that dominated their relationship with the state for years, and to take the side of the society in its struggle with the violent regime. Now the churches need to make a step further and to judge the regime honestly. In what follows, I urge the Ukrainian churches to stop collaborating with the sinful regime of Viktor Yanukovych, which was violent, corrupt, and demonstrated symptoms of dictatorship. Now, I think th what I posted uh, could be directed uh, to the Russian Orthodox Church which has identified itself with the murderous regime of Vladimir Putin. So I continue quoting. Now the churches that want to follow the example of the saints have an opportunity to articulate what the majority of the Ukrainian people, well, if you substitute Ukraine with the Russian people, it is still applicable to Russia, have clearly understood, even though these people, peoples did not study moral theology in the theological seminaries. They nevertheless clearly see that the, president, that the present regime is not Christian at all, even though its representatives demonstrate some interest in the Orthodox cult. Their Christianity is a simulacrum. It has Christian form, but not the content. It does not contain any Christian morality. This regime does not treat the others as their brothers and sisters. In their relations with God, the authorities seek that God does not impede them from obtaining new trophies from the unfortunate people, rather than consider using their power to serve their neighbor. The churches now have an opportunity to recognize that they often serve as mediators between God and the criminals, who instead of repentance seek to protect themselves from God. The churches receive commission for their mediation. However, what does this mediation lead to? It leads not only to the legitimization of corruption, but also to its sacralization. Indeed, corruption in our society has become sacred. 
The Maidan gives the churches an opportunity to change the status quo and to refuse to fulfill its mediating role, which only legitimizes corruption, social injustice, abuse of power, etc. The church now has an opportunity to step out of the dark circle of collaborationism with the criminal regime and to follow the path of the confessing church, which withstood Nazism. It is a good time to leave the metaphysical refuge and to follow Barth and Bonhoeffer in proclaiming that Christ is the Lord of everything, including politics. So that's, I think, is applicable to modern Russia as well as, as it was applicable to Ukraine in the wake of the uh, Revolution of Dignity. The wishes expressed in this text almost 10 years ago have been fulfilled, I believe, in the Ukrainian context, even if partially. All Ukrainian churches have realized the potentiality of the civil society and now are trying to cooperate with it, each to its own, own degree and its own speed. They are less relying on the state and more standing for civil values shared by the Ukrainian society. Such a tendency became even stronger with the escalation of the Russian aggression in February 2022. Now, as I said, the entire country has become a gigantic Maidan. By resisting the Russian aggression, it is, fi it is fighting back corruption, injustice, and violence that the Russian world, the so-called uh, notorious Russian world, tries to bring to the Ukrainian soil. In this fight, all Ukrainian churches and religious groups, including Jewish and Muslim, act as an organic part of the civil society, rubbing shoulders, uh, shoulders with other civil activists and volunteers. The Russian Orthodox Church has chosen, however, a different path from the one that had been chosen by the Ukrainian churches. Nevertheless, there was a chance for it to concur with the Ukrainian churches on the Maidan during the protests in the winter 2011-2012, two years before the Maidan. So it's, there, is, there is no fatalism about the choice of the Russian church. It was a deliberate church, and the church at that church tried to choose the right way to follow, but preferred not to. So during these protests uh, in the winter 2011-2012, which I remember very well because I was in Moscow, but the Moscow Patriarchate missed that chance. Instead, it chose to become a faithful supporter of the increasingly corrupt, violent, and authoritarian regime in, in Russia. It still receives its commission for legitimizing this regime by sacralizing its vices. It tries to justify this by developing a specific political theology it's not just about you know, supporting violence. They try to rationalize it. They try to develop a sort of political theology to uh, justify what they are doing in Russia. This theology is articulated as explicitly opposite to the theology of the Maidan. For example, the official speaker and the key ideologue of the Moscow Patriarchate, Alexander, Alexander Shipkov, has stated in his article published in the Parliamentary Gazette that, um, uh, quite recently, that the, I quote him, theology of the Maidan became in 2014 one of the ideological foundations of the Ukrainian coup d'etat and played a certain role in the Nazification of Ukraine. So from the Russian perspective, the theology, public theology of the Maidan is the, uh, the kind of theological frame for the Ukrainian Nazism. So you can see how the church officials use the language of the Kremlin's propaganda, which presents Ukrainians as neo-Nazi and the revolution of dignity as coup d'etat. It is not only the, church, the Russian church that uses the political language of the Kremlin. The Russian state also uses the language from the ideological vocabulary of the Moscow Patriarchate. For example, the conception of the humanitarian policy of the Russian Federation abroad, which was signed by President Putin on September 5, 2022, illustrates this reciprocity. This political document contains the highest number of references to the concepts that had been elaborated upon by the Russian Orthodox Church. One of them mentions the so-called traditional moral values. They constitute, I quote, the spiritual and cultural fundament of the Russian Federation and include the priority of the spiritual over the material, the protection of human rights and freedoms, the family, the norms of morality, humanism, and mercy. 
The document calls to, again, I quote it, to consider the growing global demand for traditional values, primarily family values, due, the, due to the aggressive imposition of neoliberal views by several states. The Russian state is increasingly perceived abroad as the custodian and protector of traditional spiritual and moral values, the spiritual heritage of world civilization, end of quote. The conception of the, of the humanitarian policy of the Russian Federation abroad also extensively refers to the notorious Russian world, a concept that became popularized by the Russian Orthodox Church. Patrick Kirill has been promoting it since the late 2000s. The Kremlin adopted it with the purpose to justify its war against Ukraine. It reappears in the mentioned conception, which postulates the need to, I quote, protect, preserve, and promote the traditions and ideals pertinent to the Russian world, end of quote. It condemns the attempt to discre uh, discredit, again I continue, discredit the Russian world, its traditions and ideals, by substituting them with pseudo-values. Patriarch Kirill and other official speakers of the Russian Orthodox Church render the concept of the Russian world as a sort of political theology. It implies that the church should have symphonic relationship with a civilization, not just the Russian state, but also a civilization, so that's how they present it. This civilization, according to such theology, is unique and has a special mission from God to save the world from sin and decadence. In other words, to save the world from itself. Well, by destroying it. The Russian civilization is described as messianic and eschatological. The world after it is impossible, or as Putin put it, why do we need a world without Russia? This is a form of symphonia with ethnos, which was so popular in the Eastern Christian milieu, especially in the 19th century. Ethnos in this symphonia is substituted by a civilization which amounts to an empire. So we are dealing with a form of nationalism where the church embraces as its partner now a civilization. This empire acts now as a new colonial power. Russia has been characterized by a number of scholars as a state with expanded, which that expanded by internal colonization. In the period of Tsars, for example, it colonized Siberia, Central Asia, Caucasus, Ukraine, Poland, Finland, and the Baltic countries. In the Soviet period, its colonizing efforts reached uh, as far as Africa, Southeast, Southeast Asia, and Latin America. Russia's colonial expansion continues in our days and has taken a form of the war in Ukraine. This war is nothing else but a continuation of the old colonial, colonial wars of the past. Russia wants to reestablish control over the colony that it has lost after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And it's remarkable that Putin called the collapse of the Soviet Union the largest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. That what happened with the collapse of the Soviet Union was just the collapse of the Soviet colonial system. For Putin, it was a catastrophe. To fulfill its goal, it recruits primarily the colonized peoples from its periphery. Russia nowadays, like Buryats, Kalmyks, Chechens, all those are small peoples who were colonized in different periods of history by Russia, and now Russia uses them as their main fighting force. They are sent to the furnace of the war ahead of the ethnic Russians. The proportion of, the, of those small ethnicities of Russia who were killed in Ukraine is much larger than the uh, number of the Russians who actually were killed. The moment Russia conquers a piece of land in Ukraine, it starts recruiting locals to fight the Ukrainian forces. They just, you know, hunt people in their homes, take them to the uh, units and force them to, uh, to fight their compatriots, essentially. This is nothing else but a scenario from the classical playbooks of colonialism. Yet, Putin presents his war as the one against colonialism, as he did recently on the 30th of September. The entire kind of uh, 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 frame of his speech when he um, accepted the four dissident regions of Ukraine into the Russian Federation, he presented, he justified his activities as the fight against the global coloni colonialism. 
In this, he follows the pattern of the Russian propaganda, accuse others of what you are doing yourself. So if you accuse others of what you are doing yourself, then many people would see that you are not supposed to do the same thing, would not think about you as doing these things. So this is the way to avoid, you know, uh, to avoid uh, responsibility for what, uh, what he is doing. By doing so, Putin tries to bring to his side the countries which have suffered from colonialism, especially in the global south. I should say that his effort, efforts are not unsuccessful, unfortunately. Which is a tragedy, because many in the global south who continue struggling with the real consequences of the colonial era, at the same time demonstrate either passive or active support to Putin. Unfortunately, such a support undermines their justifiable anti-colonial efforts. The Russian aggression against Ukraine is driven by civilizational exceptionalism, which forges together nationalism and imperialism, as well as by unreserved etatism, with the state seen as the main partner for the churches. These are the defining features of the political theology that stems from the concept of the Russian world, and which is opposite to the Ukrainian Maidan. In contrast to what I would call the political theology of the Russian world, the, what I would call the public theology of the Maidan, emphasizes the crucial importance of relations between the church and civil society. Because of this, I would be more it would be more appropriate to call it public rather than political theology. That's why I call it public theology of the Maidan, not the political theology of the Maidan. While the term political is more appropriate for the theology of the Russian world, I would not call it a public theology of the Russian world, would call it political theology of the Russian world. The public theology of the Maidan is alternative to any theological justification for nationalism and imperialism. It is opposite to all forms of exceptionalism, which the political theology of the Russian world promotes. It does not mean, of course, that the public theology of the Maidan ignores a positive role that the state can play for the church, well, as far as they stay separated. I believe that this public theology, which values the church, the church society symphonia more than the traditional symphonias with the state or ethnos or civilization, is an important task for the global community of political theologians. I'd like to use the opportunity of speaking from this stage, generously provided by the Global Network for Public Theology, to make my appeal. I should remind us that in the past, public theologians from different traditions and contexts helped to deconstruct theologies that had underpinned Nazism and other authoritarian and totalitarian regimes, as well as apartheid. That was a common effort of all Christian uh, public uh, thinkers across the globe to help the local churches to overcome uh, the sins of collaboration with sinful regimes. Now we, and by we I mean uh, Orthodox theologians from Eastern Europe, need your help to deconstruct Putinism afresh and the most evil incarnation of the old evil. We cannot do it on our own. But with the help of the collective wisdom that the GNPT represents, this task is possible. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Cyril Hoverun, um, for a very, very rich uh, reflection from, should I say, the eye of the hurricane. And uh, in the first place, let me express our solidarity with all those who suffer in Ukraine and around it. And of course, we are to some extent all affected by the economic and political consequences, but also here in this surrounding deeply with the theological consequence of what is happening. So thank you so much for leading us into this. Um, we had uh, some days ago, we main, was mentioned the Belhar Confession 40 years ago, which on his, in, in its turn had drawn on the Barman Declaration, as did the declaration, the recent declaration uh, from March, I believe, uh, on the Russian world, Correct. and um, which caught a lot of attention in the style it uses um, to to denote the danger the church suffers when it submits to the state. 
And uh, the other thing uh, which caught my attention, you spoke about Alexander Dugin, uh, one of the ideologists of, uh, ideologists of uh, Putin. And there is a, a book many of you might know by Benjamin Teitelbaum or Titelbaum on War on Eternity, where he precisely uh, parallels uh, Steve Bannon, Olavo di Carvalho, and Alexander Dugin, so in their influence on Russia, Brazil, and the United States. So uh, although we are far from a war, thankfully for us, tragically for you, it's, uh, we are in a, in a struggle about what society is to mean and how it is to be. So thank you so much for uh, this, and I think it resonates with much of what we've heard and talked about these days. Now we have some time for discussion, for questions and uh, reactions. So the microphone is open. Yeah, there are two there. Patricia will come to you with the microphone. You have to push the button. So first uh, Pauline, then Sebastian, then um, Joanildo. Can we take more than one question in a row? Is that okay? Or would you prefer well, to, it's to, to take one by one? One by one. So okay. So Pauline, please. Thank you very much for your very interesting and stimulating talk. I understand it was reported um, in the Western media in March this year that there were approximately 275 very, very small um, Russian clergy around the world, including yep. some within uh, Russia, particularly in Moscow, uh, that wrote an open letter to Putin opposing the war and um, basically saying it was wrong, it was not, uh, you know, what should be done um, from the theology of the Russian Orthodox Church. So, um, two questions to you about that. Um, could you give me your views on whether you think that's going to sort of snowball? Mm -hmm. Because it's very difficult, I know, for them within Russia, listen to some Russian speakers in Bologna in the summer, um, online, <laughs> obviously. Um, but uh, the other question is, you mentioned the wisdom of Global Network for Public Theology, and I totally agree with you that, you know, Christians of all denominations around the world should be uh, finding ways to support those within the Russian Orthodox Church uh, to oppose Putin. So what types of things would you say would be useful for Christians, and not just obviously Christians as well, yeah. um, to be supporting these people? Yeah, thank you for the questions for both of them. Well, regarding the uh, the declaration, which indeed was signed by approximately 300 indeed clergy of the Russian Church in the, in March, uh, that was quite a bold step indeed. Uh, well, to my taste, personal taste, that declaration was kind of had too many euphemisms, to, so to say. Uh, but still, it was a very good uh, it, it was a very good uh, text and. Uh, uh, most of those who signed it uh, live outside Russia, so they are not uh, exposed to any 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 threat. Uh, and uh, yet, imagine that it's 300 people out of 40,000 clergy. It's less than one percent who uh, explicitly condemned uh, the war. And uh, I would say that nowadays. Uh, at least the, uh, I am in touch with many people, you know, still in, in Russia and in the Russian church. I would say, well, the true many people disagree with what is happening, but they keep silent because it's, it's now uh, uh, um, 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 kind of a crime to, uh, to criticize the Russian army, the Russian regime, for what they're doing in Ukraine. So if you criticize, you go to prison, essentially. And they are really afraid to do that. Um, but they they still disagree, and you know they they share their disagreement uh, in well informally and of course not publicly. Um, I would say that the, uh, there is a tiny minority in the Russian Church, which is uh, which is against the war, publicly, explicitly, really uh, you know dozens of people. Uh, then uh, uh, there is a, a minority. Uh, I would say also dozens, but more than the minority who are against, who are for the war, and they are like the speakers, the advocates of the war. They, you know, go to the channels, uh, uh, TV, Russian state media, and so forth, and they make their statements in support of the war. Uh, then uh, there is a vast majority which is silent, and that vast majority is divided into two parts. Uh, a lesser part of this vast majority is silent and is passively against the war the majority of the majority is silent and is passively in support of the war. Uh, 
that would be my kind of uh, sociological uh, explication of, of, the, of the support to the war from, from the Russian clergy or the Russian people. Um, um, speaking in terms of, of the wisdom uh, from the network, what can be done? Well, we don't need, as we say, we don't need to invent a bike. Uh, it's already there. And I think the experience of tackling apartheid by, uh, by the global uh, public theology could be of great value uh, for us, uh, I mean, in, in Ukraine uh, and in Russia, eventually. Um, also, uh, even further into, into the past, uh, the way how German Christianity was helped to overcome the traumas, the, the wrongdoings of Deutsche Christen and all those movements that supported Nazi regime. It was of extreme help. And I, we should, well, we all know that the modern public theology was born out of that effort, right? Through Moltmann and others. And uh, it, it has, like, the modern public theology has in its DNA this opposition to Nazism, to all those. Uh, totalitarian ideology. So I, need, I, need, I think we need to just to, to, to use this DNA nowadays to tackle the present situation. And uh, uh, that would be my call to kind of to bring your experiences from your context. And each context has a richness to, uh, to provide to tackle this particular issue. And I think it is really a very burning, it's, it's well, it's not a, a question of life and death even for us. Given the danger of the nuclear Armageddon, it's really, it can affect everyone. And this is a theological issue. Look, Putin thinks metaphysically when he takes decisions. For him, he, his, his worldview is dualistic, it's Manichean, profoundly Manichean. He looks the world in black and white. For him, there is a, a, a really a, a damaged and evil part of the world, of this creation, which is the West which he tries to kind of to oppose and he believes that Russia is like a holy island of sanctity and you know of whiteness uh, a kind of a cosmic goodness incarnated in Russia and he believes that he protects it so for him when he sees that the evil part of the world is unchangeable is unrepentable the only way to purge it is just to use you know the ultimate weapon of purging he thinks in these terms, unfortunately, and that's why what he, what he is promoting, what he's saying, what he's thinking needs to be approached also from the metaphysical perspective, from the theological perspective. That's why uh, we should not be an idle standby, you know, uh, as theologians. It's an opportunity for the theologians to really uh, do something important because it is important because this war is not secular. This war is metaphysical, at least in the minds of those who, who wage it. And it needs to be dealt on the grounds of theology. Thank you very much. Sebastian, please. Uh, uh, it's a similar question, so I think we can pass on. Okay, then Joan Hildo. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Um, and I would also like to express uh, our solidarity, uh, considering particularly how the Brazilian state has, uh, in a very pragmatic but hypocritical way, dealt with the conflict by not taking clear sides other than negotiating with Russia on, on grain and, and oil. Yeah. Uh, and presenting that as a Trump uh, within the uh, electoral campaign. Thank you for that. I didn't dare myself to say it. I'm, I'm very happy that a Brazilian says it. <laughs> yes, yes, we have to. Um, I have two questions for you. Uh, one of them is, uh, to what extent you think historically about this, um, say, um, opposition of state and civil society and how would you reason historically about that or whether you have a principled position that the state is the bad side and civil society is the good side of this um, from a latin american perspective the struggle against uh, military rule in in the 70s 80s and, and in some countries even into the 90s uh, this kind of logic, which is, I think, understandable, if you yeah. speak from the eye of the hurricane, uh, survival is, is paramount, and, and you are yeah. in danger, so you have yeah. to think clearly and positively. And in, in, in our case, 
civil society was the place from which you had to confront the state because the state was impermeable to yeah. uh, to popular you know uh, demands to criticism and, and, and it, any of that and also we could look back to decades of authoritarian regimes yeah. uh, uh, which took over the state and and made it impermeable to the popular uh, needs and everything and voices but then once once the resistance from the state is at least partially broken, some kind of interconnection of state and civil society develops because through civil society participation, more people get access to, yeah. s to state you know, uh, 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 spaces. And, and at public policy level, at the legal level, at the representation level. So, would you think that in this particular case you're making, uh, we might come to a different yeah. position in the future where a kind of more relational understanding of state and civil society yeah. could apply? Yeah. Or, or would it be the case that this historical weight of authoritarianism, dictatorships that you mentioned at the beginning make this kind of move impossible? Yeah. That's the first thing. And the second thing, very quickly, is how would you read from the perspective of your argument the situation within Ukrainian, Ukraine itself and the relationship between the government or the, the Ukrainian state and civil society? Yeah, thank you. Uh, both questions are interrelated and I can answer uh, both of them in one answer. Uh, certainly, a state is not evil per se, it's not bad per se, uh, and uh, the, therefore this antagonism between the state and the civil society is not uh, something intrinsic. Uh, it's conditioned historically and uh, it's contextual, right? Um, so what happened in Ukraine was exactly this uh, very clear, very sharp um, antagonism between the state and the civil society and you know, the revolution of dignity. And eventually this revolution and this antagonism society, the civil society prevailed. Uh, but I would not say that it reconciled with the state. Even now, there is some kind of antagonism even between the current government you know, and the civil society. The civil society it's, uh, still tries to, to keep in check everything that the government does and doesn't trust. They don't trust each other. There is no trust. There is a kind of um, uh, symbiosis nowadays because they need to survive together, right? But they still don't trust. Uh, I mean, the Zelensky government and the, and the, uh, the public sector, uh, the uh, civil society. Uh, but it is uh, eventually, it, well, this antagonism can be resolved eventually. And I think the, the key to the resolution, to reconciliation between the state and the civil society is democracy. When there is democracy, then there is a reconciliation. Dem democracy actually brings the, the power of, of civil society to, to the state and, and, and back. When there is a kind of deficient democracy, then there is still an antagonism. And if you, if you take the Ukraine situation, it's not a complete democracy yet, because there is still a hidden um, uh, kind of counterposition between the state and the, and the civil society. And in Russia, uh, the complete lack of democracy means that there is no civil society there anymore. There is only the state, uh, like what Mussolini used to say, lo stato totale, the total state. That's exactly the Russian model uh, without the civil society. So, yeah, of course, there should be reconciliation. There is, it's a goal, and democracy is the best way to reach that point. Thank you. Uh, yes, please, Kobus. Um, Thank you very much. I'm from South Africa. Uh, so our own government's uh, position, or lack of position, uh, has pained many of us. Um, the involvement of some of our own uh, people, for example, in the referendums, um, uh, is a point of deep contention, and I apologize for that. Uh, we are also complicit. Um, I'm also from the Dutch Reformed Church. I'm an ordained minister from the Dutch Reformed Church. So when the, the history of the struggle against apartheid is, is called up, it's something that we continue to have to grapple with. So, so two, um, two questions out of that. The one would be, uh, you mentioned the struggle against apartheid, and I'm wondering if you see parallels between uh, apartheid, the theological justification of apartheid, 
and the theological justification yeah. of Russian imperialism, if you see parallels between the two and what those would be. Yeah. But then the, perhaps the more important question, during the struggle against apartheid, the church played a key role, the ecumenical church played a key role in the way that it uh, came alongside theologians within South yeah. Africa. And this were theologians that were involved in the struggle, but importantly also theologians that were in the Dutch Reformed Church. Mm -hmm. And their ecumenical relations, sometimes slowly, sometimes silently, was key to changing those that were, in fact, theologically justifying apartheid to convert. And I'm wondering what you would see yeah. as the role of the church in coming alongside yeah. uh, Russian ch church leaders, Russian theologians, from different sides uh, in both their support and their, their opposition to what is happening in, in working alongside them, supporting them, what would be our role at right. this stage? Thank you, thank you for both questions. Regarding the first question, uh, if you take some official statements by the Russian officials, like for example, um, uh, the former Minister of Culture of Russia, Medinsky, uh, he famously said that Russians have an extra chromosome in their DNA. Sincerely, that was his kind of statement. He believes that the Russians are like superior, at least regarding the Ukrainians, ontologically, you know, physiologically, which gives them right to kill, to rape, and to, uh, to exercise all sorts of violence. Uh, uh, so this ontologization of the ethnic differences, I think is pertinent to apartheid, right? Because apartheid is about the ontology of the diversity within the human race. This kind of ontologization of diversity we are seeing in the statements by Putin's officials. That's why I believe uh, what they do in Ukraine when they come is resembles the images, horrible images of what the uh, uh, what they did to the protesters, black protesters in South Africa uh, in the period of overcoming apartheid. Brutality, murder, uh, uh, lack of any, any law. Because they are driven by this idea of their ontological superiority. That would be my answer to the, the first question. Regarding the second question, uh, which I don't remember now, or can you repeat it, please? I'm sorry. Uh, it involves the, what does it mean to come alongside Russia? Yeah, 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 good, 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 good. Yes, well, uh, the recent example of the activities of the World Council of Churches, which had played a crucial role in overcoming the theological crisis caused by apartheid, right? Uh, at that time, I think the WCC worked much more successfully than it is now. That's my personal judgment. I'm very judgmental regarding this. Uh, and uh, the recent General Assembly of the World Council of Churches in Karlsruhe demonstrated the inability of the WCC. I think what matters more, and again, I don't want to generalize. There are nice people in churches in the WCC. They, uh, I, 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 by saying the WCC does this or doesn't do that, it's a generalization which doesn't make justice to them. But. Uh, my feeling is that the general policy of the WCC is to uh, give priority to the quantity rather than the quality of this organization. That's why they, keep, they try to keep membership as full as possible, including the Russian church, at any price, at the price of you know, losing the quality. I'm very harsh, I know, uh, but that's how I feel. I don't think the WCC can play now a leading role in the, in the, in the same way as, as it played in the times of apartheid. Probably other ecumenical initiatives, and there are some non-official, not established, then can, can help, they can help more. Maybe this forum can be more helpful than the you know, established ecumenical organizations in uh, dealing with the issues that we are facing. Thank you, Anne Great Schilling, and then Thomas Wabel. Thank you. It now relates quite well to my question. I'm coming from Germany, and um, I followed the discussion around the um, assembly. Um, I'm, pr I'm, I'm in a parish uh, where we host a Russian Orthodox Church, and uh, my experience is that they follow a totally non-political position. Mm -hmm. 
And the archpriest in, in the dialogue we have, or in the talks we, ha we had with him, tells me he wants to keep politics out of his congregation for the sake mm -hmm. of having the harmony among the people. So this reminded me a lot what you were saying about the symphony. And uh, for me as a Protestant theologian, that's very difficult. Yeah. <laughs> ex partic ex um, um, especially because coming from this Martin Niemöller tradition exactly. in my church, right? So it was a very difficult talk we had with this archpriest because we couldn't find common ground at all. Yeah. So my question for you is, first, can you help me to understand this non-political position? Um, of this Russian, Russian Orthodox congregation, although Kirill's rhetoric is very political, but this archpriest denies yeah. um, to say the, uh, that Kirill was political at all. And um, the second question is, um, how is it possible to isolate this political theology you were referring to mm -hmm and to isolate this rhetoric of the Russian Orthodox Church? Yeah. Or is it, is it by, by seizing the dialogue, as some people um, suggested? Also, they suggested it also to the WCC, but it was not received. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for Thank the you questions. So much. Thank you. Well, regarding neutrality and regarding not talking about things, uh, I, would, I could understand uh, people who promote this kind of rhetoric. Uh, because they want to, to preserve the integrity of the community. But the integrity of the, uh, of the communities has been already lost. People have left the churches, even the neutral churches. That's a reality. Well, the Ukrainians cannot stand even the Russian language in the church. I mean, it's, it's, it's emotional, it's, maybe it's pathetic, but it's the reality. It, it's like such a shock, people have such a shock that they can't hear you know, the Russian speech in the communities. Um, and... Uh, uh, of course, everyone decides for himself. I mean, uh, in, in the case of the of the uh, of the priests in the communities, what line to follow. I think uh, at this moment, uh, it's it's when you have a deadly disease like cancer, and you just try not to talk about this, hoping that it will disappear itself. No, it's, it will not. It needs surgery, and surgery needs words. I mean, in our case, it's 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 theological statements. We need to to make them in order to, to deal with this, uh, this disease. Um, yes, and uh, regarding the second question, uh, regarding the second question, well, I again forgot it. <laughs> I just, uh, just one, two words, uh, remind me. Is it possible to isolate? Yeah, the isolate, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, well, I think it is... Uh, Well, this entire ideology of the Russian world has been, that's my argument, has been produced actually by the church, has been promoted. Or to better say, to, to say originally it emerged uh, as a very kind of uh, pro-democratic rhetoric in the 90s. And uh, then, uh, and it was elitist, very much elitist. Then the Russian church took it and changed it to a massive ideology and uh, made a U-turn regarding this, the rhetoric. So the rhetoric became like nationalistic, became really exceptionalistic, uh, isol uh, isolationistic. So essentially it's now uh, it's one ideology supported commonly by the Kremlin and by the church. There is no differentiation, much differentiation between them. The church, uh, the, the Kremlin uses the language of the church and uh, uh, the church uh, contributes to this ideology. Therefore, uh, and it's an interesting experience also of cooperation with, uh, with people from political science, you know, political uh, uh, sociology and so forth. So I'm, I'm in many meetings and many discussions about this. And people who try to understand, you know, Putin's mind and try to understand to decode the Kremlin's policies, they necessarily they understand they need to, to, uh, to ask theologians what to do about that. That's kind of a unique experience, right? Uh, therefore... I think it's impossible to isolate, to differentiate the kind of the language of the church from the language, political language of the Kremlin. Therefore, it needs to be done, it needs to be dealt with uh, as a complex. So we as, say, political public theologians, if we want to uh, to cope with that, we need to, then we address both political and, uh, uh, and theological uh, statements produced uh, by them. And I believe it cannot be accommodated, cannot be really, you know, you cannot... Uh, 
apply hermeneutics to what they say in, and to say, well, it's not so kind of clear cut, it can be understood this way or that way. No, it's very clear cut. It's very uh, sharp what they say and it needs to be rejected in the same sharp way. I think deconstructed. I think, I, I, I usually I don't like deconstruction things, but I think this is the case when full, the full force of deconstruction needs to be applied. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I also come from a Protestant background, uh, Protestant and German background. Um, I very much sympathize with your analytical tools of a metaphysics of Manichaeism on the one hand and the alternative symphonia of um, pairing with a civil society on the other hand. Now, um, my question is uh, theological, but it might have political implications. Um, if I were to describe um, what two main factors in our ecclesiology are for Protestantism um, as far as the relation to a civil society is concerned. One would be Luther's theology of the two kingdoms, mm -hmm. um, which uh, led to a decoupling of church and state. Uh, which then was quite fruitful in, in the uh, centuries to come. And the other is um, a cultural factor um, that uh, the church, I, I suppose any church, is de deeply rooted in its culture, yeah. also including its language, its ways of living, ways of thought, um, without being identical with it. And this is what went wrong uh, during Deutsche Christen. Yeah. And um, how would you describe your own church um, and an ecclesiology of your own church yeah. in relation to these two factors? Yeah, yeah I, I believe uh, that there is a distorted ecclesiology behind this ideology, certainly a distorted picture of the church. Actually, I should say, when I, it's, it's part of my personal story. Um, I left the Moscow Patriarchate where I, wor I worked uh, with Patriarch Kirill uh, for 10 years. I left in 2012 after we disagreed on, uh, on the Ukrainian issue, actually. We disagreed on the concept of the Russian world. I saw it coming up, and I really was horrified by what was coming and tried to warn him. You know, it didn't work. That's why I, I quit my job and I went to Yale. <coughs> and at Yale, I started writing, I, I wrote two ecclesiological books essentially as a reaction to my work in the Moscow Patriarchate. The, the kind of my experiences of working in Moscow uh, instigated me actually to deal with, to switch from patristics to ecclesiology. And I still believe ecclesiology is a key to understand what is going on. Even though I understand ecclesiology is just for, is for chosen, it's not for everyone, of course. And uh, you, you cannot you know, uh, convince people on the basis of ecclesiology. But I'm very thankful for this question because I, I think it really hits the core of the problem is the, the, the way how the church is perceived and the church there uh, in Moscow is perceived primarily as, well, as hierarchy. The patriarch uh, seeing himself as the church. It's almost like Louis XIV, uh, uh, moi et all, you know, I'm the state. Well, when a, pa a patriarch or a, a hierarch identifies himself with the church, that leads to this kind of, this kind of, uh, 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 distortions. So also, it has to do with a broader, as, uh, of course, uh, scope of uh, uh, church-state relations, and generally the church and the public square. Uh, I believe Patrick Kirill really wanted. He 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 is the father of the modern Russian political theology. Well, I would not exaggerate by saying that. I think, uh, and uh, his vision was to get the church out of the ghetto where it ended up in the, had ended up in the Soviet era. And he wanted to regain for the church a prominent public space, a central space in the public space, in the kind of, in the public square. And uh, he saw an opportunity for the church to regain its central place in the public square by dealing with the regime. And it worked. I mean, the church, the Russian church is now the public square in Russia. Right? It, has, it has occupied it and monopolized it, but it comes at a price. And we, we are, what we are doing, doing here, we are discussing the price, right? But the gain for the church is that it is central. Um, and it is the sort of ecclesiology that underpins this idea. You can trade you know, your values, what you are, for where you want to be. That's what has happened. 
Thank you very, very much, uh, Cyril. I, I th I'm sure there are many more questions and thoughts that would follow up with this. We have coffee break for this, and I hope you're patient enough to, <laughs> to bear uh, our interest. Uh, but thank you so much from, uh, from your trajectory, from your story, from your reflections, from your experience, from which from where you have spoken, and I think appeal to all of us in terms of what goes very deep into life and very deep into our faith. So thank you so much. Let me, let's give a warm applause to Cyril for his presence and talk.